for the very first time. We now have scientific evidence to support what many of us have suspected all along. Economic and social inequality is simply detrimental to humanity. It robs us of our physical health, our mental health, and our happiness, even if we are the very rich. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today our guest is Kate Lohr, who is the Social Justice Minister at the First Unitarian Church here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, she has been our guest once before. She recently did a sermon at the, uh, at the First Unitarian Church titled, So Rich, So Poor, How Today's Divided so Society Endangers Our Future. And so I asked her to re-deliver that sermon for us today. At the church, there's always a responsive reading, and so I've asked her to begin with that responsive reading. Kate Lohr. Thank you, David. This reading is by Frederick Douglass, and it's called The Limit of Tyrants. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are people who want crops without plow plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Find out what people will submit to, and you have found out the exact amount of injustice which will be imposed upon them. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. So ends the reading. After three long years, we finally make it to the top of the waiting list. We're spending 10 glorious days in one of the most beautiful spots of the Caribbean. Keneal Bay Resort on the island of St. John in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's Christmas break and three generations of my husband's family side are gathered here. My mother-in-law, bless her heart, is footing the entire bill. What a gift. I've never been to a place like this before. A full two-thirds of the island is a nature preserve, so there are hardly any developments or people. The beaches are pristine. As I step into the warm white sands and breathe in the crisp, salty air, my mind slows down and my senses awaken. After a while, I put on my snorkel and fins and step backwards into the water. What I discover are the most spectacular reefs I've ever seen. They are vital and healthy and teeming with life. Fish of all colors and sizes surround me, not in hopes of being fed as they do in many resort areas, but simply because they live here. I smile as I recognize the scrape, scrape, scraping sound of the reef parrot's fish grazing on the coral algae. As I look around, I see lobsters and cuttlefish and sea turtles and so many wondrous creatures that I'm wishing I had some sort of app to identify them. I want to call each one by their full and proper name. This, I say to myself, is heaven on earth and I know in my heart that it's true. So it surprises me when I come back to the shore at the end of the day to discover that my in-laws in find this place displeasing. The resort is chock full of movie stars, a good thing to be able to tell the folks back home, but there are no phones, no televisions, and well, they really don't like the people who live on this island. The taxi drivers drive so recklessly around here, one says. I thought for sure I would die today. Have you noticed, grouses another, the local residents are so fat and dull looking. Have you ever seen such ugly people? And they have completely slaughtered the English language. 
I can't understand a word they say. It's true, concurs another, and their art looks like it was created by children. I can't find a decent piece of art or jewelry on the entire island. One of my nephews, who is quickly learning the mealtime routine, pipes in. Can somebody please tell me why on earth we have to keep hearing Christmas carols put to reggae music? It's so stupid and monotonous. Wow. I sit there, shocked into silence. Really, people, I say to myself, as I grapple for the words to stop this hateful conversation. And then it dawns on me. These people, these very wealthy and privileged people, are soul sick. They've spent their entire lives in gated communities. They've been raised to think that racism is OK and that money determines one's wealth. And now, they're so, so disconnected from the world, so xenophobic, that they are blind to the paradise that's surrounding them. What a steep price to pay for success, mutters my inner critic. And that is how our country defines them as very successful. They have great wealth, the women are all beautiful, and they have easy access to the White House. My former father-in-law, even worked for Ronald Reagan. My inner critic is going crazy. How could I have married into a family like this? How will I ever learn to love them? Well, though I am no longer in that family, I was for 25 years, and I did learn how to love them. And that time on St. John Island was the beginning of my ever unfolding understanding of just how much we all pay for inequality, even those who reportedly or seemingly benefit most from it. Since that vacation in paradise, I've read a lot of books and learned that my f former in-laws were actually exhibiting symptoms that predictably arise when societies become extremely unequal. Nobody's happy. Nobody thrives, everyone gets objectified, and everyone suffers. But before I expand on that, let me share four statistics to help establish just how unequal we've become. These are all from 2012. The top 1% have an average income of $200 million per year. The bottom 90% of us, however, earn an average of $31,000 per year. That's a 65,000 to 1 ratio, and it grow, it's growing larger every year. Half of the full-time jobs in this country now pay less than $34,000 a year, and half of those pay $22,000 or less, which is well below the poverty line for a family of four. Moreover, even with our current social security system, one in seven senior citizens now experiences hunger. That's a whopping 78% from the prior decade. And lastly, one in seven adults in this country and one in four children now requires food stamp assistance. Actor Jeff Bridges frames our problem this way. Quote, 35 million people in the United States are hungry and don't know where their next meal is coming from. And 13 million of them are children. If another country were doing this to our children, we'd be at war. End quote. And some say that we are indeed at war in this country, a class war. But this is a war that has no winners. It's hurting us all, including the 1%. Let me explain. In 2007, 
British epidemiologist Richard Wilkinson published some highly acclaimed research results in his book called The Spirit Level, Why Greater Equality Makes Societies Stronger. His findings shocked the academic community and spawned a whole new series of other books. What did these other author authors find so compelling? Well, it, it seems as though any time the income gap widens in a society between the most wealthy and the poorest, almost every modern social problem increases as well. This explains why the U.S., by most measures the richest nation on earth, has a per capita shorter lifespan, more depression and mental illness, more obesity, and more of its people in prison than any other developed nation. So, for the very first time, we now have scientific evidence to support what many of us have suspected all along. Economic and social inequality is simply detrimental to humanity. It robs us of our physical health, our mental health, and our happiness, even if we are the very rich. Relatively equal societies, on the other hand, are healthier on virtually every indicator in individual and social health and well-being. It's a fascinating discovery. But what do we make of it? Well, it all boils down to the ways in which societies relate to money, nature, and the common good. When a society justifies the pursuit of personal wealth over the well-being of nature or the common good, everything and every body becomes a commodity. Life gets stripped of its sacredness and people lose their sense of connection to others, including Mother Earth. And when this happens, our spirits wither and decline with all sorts of negative health effects. Now, in the case of my former in-laws, their relationship to money, nature, and community is troubling. Their family motto, and I kid you not, is this, cash is king. They say it all the time. And their connection to nature? Well, one of the reasons why my former husband's family is so wealthy is because my father-in-law's company produced and sold Agent Orange. For anyone unfamiliar with Agent Orange, the United States sprayed over 20 million gallons of this toxin on Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia during the Vietnam War, destroying forests and food crops for many, many years. We are still suffering from this sacrilege. Agent Orange most directly impact the psyche of generations of Southeast Asians, but it has also impacted the psyche of those made wealthy by its use. <laughs> it's damaged the reputation of the United States for both the loss of life and the damage to our Mother Earth. Indeed, it has really damaged all of us. We all have a bit of soul sickness. So what can we do to heal from this sacrilege? Well, I would suggest we restore the tree of life. Now, if you came to First Unitarian Church, you may have noticed that there's a tree of life tapestry that hangs in the chapel. It hangs front and center, above the choir loft, the most prominent religious symbol you'll find in this church. But few remember that it's actually the second one to hang there. That's because the original tapestry was damaged in the 1965 fire that destroyed most of our church. Determined to rise like a phoenix, however, our congregation banded together to repair our church and commission a new Tree of Life tapestry. And that is what we need to do now. We sit here in the blackened ashes of our former dreams, hopes, and opportunities. The dreams and opportunities dashed in what we have come to know 
as the Great Recession. We need to band together, rich, poor, and in between, and rise like a phoenix to restore and reweave our tree of life. For as Dr. King once said, we are tied in a single garment of destiny, a network of mutuality. So our job now is to weave a world that's worthy of our children. To do that, we need to unweave old destructive patterns such as greed and oppression and empire. And we need to weave in more patterns of compassion and sustainability. Big task, I know, but here are three things you can do beginning immediately to help repair and restore our tree of life. One, before it's too late, we must recognize that money is a means and not an end. That when money frames the debate, money is the winner and life is the loser. Instead, let us frame the debate around sustainability. No more short-term thinking for personal gain. An injury to one really is an injury to the entire tree of life. Now the second thing comes directly from Joseph Stieglitz, the winner of the Nobel, the Nobel Prize for Economics. He tells us to do this, support workers and citizens collective actions. Now our mainstream media outlets are paid to make you fear unionists and protesters. Don't believe them. As Frederick Douglass stated so clearly in that opening reading, those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are people who want crops without plowing up the ground. The limit of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Thus, no one will truly prosper in this country until everyone has the opportunity to be productive and secure. And lastly, our next large-scale protest opportunity will be on Sunday afternoon, October 7th. The Occupy Portland and local peace activists, including me, are coming together for a march and a rally the day after the Portland Marathon. It's called Occupy Portland, Not Afghanistan. It's October 7th. Please join us. And lastly, and this one is simple. The willingness to share does not make one charitable. It makes one free. So help one another whenever you can. Now, for more ideas on how you can make a difference, please keep turning into the Populist Dialogues with David Delk. And as I prepare to end this part and go over there, let me ask that you go now in peace, as we say in church, and practice love. Amen. Great. Thank you so much for bringing those words to our program. You're welcome, David. It's a pleasure. Yeah. I, I uh, particularly, well, when I grew up, my mother was Catholic, and, but we never went to church, so I didn't really get any formal Catholic uh, religious training or, or indoctrination. Uh, what I did get is uh, that my impression was that most, if not all, churches supported the status quo. And for me, the status quo was that we were very poor, and as you've noted, some people were very rich. Right. And uh, in the 60 years that I have been alive, that has only gotten worse. That's right. In right. fact, you know, I too came from a very poor background, um, single mom um, who got minimum wage. But there was a significant difference between when I was ready to go to college and now. Uh, back in the 70s, we had a commitment. We, we understood that education is the great equalizer. So I got to go to college for free. Mm -hmm. I had good grades, but there was Pell Grants A and B and plenty of 
scholarships for young and poor people, and that is something that our current generation does not have, and it, it's a travesty. Mm -hmm. Right. So you grow up in poverty, the likelihood is that you will remain there Absolutely. or just get a little bit better. I mean, my, my story is very similar to yours, single, single, single mo mother uh, and uh, had a twin brother, mm -hmm. and uh, we were always poor, and when she died, uh, she was still extremely poor, but I did get that college education because I yeah. also had uh, grants, and when I graduated from uh, college, I think I owed less than a thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, and we were able to become productive, yes. tax-paying citizens so right. that we could help future generations have yes. that same opportunity. Right, yes, right. So what really strikes me is the, the difference between what I perceived when I was growing up as to be the religious message, which was you don't challenge the, uh, the proper order of things, uh, or at least religious people don't do that. Uh, the difference between that and what you have suggested, in particular, you're calling people to yes. stand up and protest and just support workers and citizens' actions. That's right. right. Well, um, you know, there's a lot I could say about the Catholic Church, but one positive thing I can say is that they have always been good around um, people's struggles. They, that, where they have stuck out their neck is for people's struggles, and all you have to do is think of all of the Central and South American struggles that um, priests have, and nuns have lost their lives mm -hmm. supporting. And so, yes, um, and Jesus actually was, uh, I'm one of those strange children who went to church on my own. And I went there because I was intrigued with this message that I kept hearing referred to as Jesus, who actually is pretty clear on what we need to do to support people um, who are hungry, who are homeless, who are sick, who have no jobs. And I like that. That's actually what got me to go to church as a 10-year-old all by myself. I like that Jesus guy. <laughs> now, um, if you were to look at my refrigerator, you would see this magnet that says, and it's a picture of somebody on the phone, and it says, Jesus is on the phone and he wants his religion back. And that's what I think might happen if Jesus were to come back today and see what we have done in his name, I think he'd be appalled. And I'm appalled. Um, I'm a minister. I have a deep spiritual life, but it's very hard for me to see what religion and religious beliefs are doing in our world right now. You know. Yeah, my perception now is that most religions share the same basic values and that they are much more in congruent with what you're talking about right. than what I have perceived to be traditional religious values right. um, and values today which are you know are, are still very much out there although luckily I don't experience them myself <laughs> yeah well you know I once wrote a sermon uh, it was uh, based on a book with this title it's called the religious case against belief and the, the main point of the book is when we fixate on our belief systems, all of the differences in us come to the forefront. But if we instead focus on what we love and value, then that's where we come together. So when we think about what we want for our children, all children, we want them to have enough food and we want them to be safe and to have a good education and the opportunity to, to find purpose in living. And, um, you know, we, we value beauty and nature, and there's so many things, and families, and taking care of one another. There's so much that we share in common. Um, but for some reason, we're not focusing on that right now in history. We're focusing on all those belief systems that separate us. Right, right, yeah. And your call for people to come out into the streets for mm. this rally yes. uh, against the war in Afghanistan yes. now in its 11th year. That's right. Um, right. And right, October 7th. Right. I'll be there. I'm actually going to speak in it. And um, I have to say that this Occupy movement has given me a lot of hope. I know it's messy. Um, I know there's all sorts of persons, but it's brought issues out from the shadow, like how many people are homeless, uh, into the public light, and people are not afraid of agitating because they have nothing to lose anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a mom of two adult uh, young men, and they both had to register, 
uh, you have to register with the, arm, the serv armed services in order to um, actually apply for any sort of scholarships. And um, and they go to college and come up with the debts that I, that you and I didn't have, and then they can't find any decent paying job. So they're willing to go onto the streets. And um, that's why I say that it's not just them who should be out there. Mm -hmm. It should be all of us, because we'll all stand to gain if we can um, reduce that huge gap between uh, income levels in this country. Great. Great, good. Thank you so much for being here, Kate. Well, thank you for having Great. me, David. Great, good. good. So we've been talking with Kate Lohr, who's the Social Justice Minister at the First Unitarian Church here in Portland. And uh, we, are, we are declaring her our uh, minister in residence for this program. So Thank I, you, David. <laughs> okay, great, yeah. So uh, as Kate said, uh, we, there will be a rally march on, on, during the first week of October, marking yet another year of war in Afghanistan. It also marks the first year start of Occupy Portland. Therefore, we will gather to protest the war and also to celebrate Occupy Portland with a two-day event. On Saturday, October 6th, gather at Shemansky Park in Portland's downtown for a rally and march. That is at the South Park blocks at Southwest Salmon Street. The rally and march starts at 12 noon. The next day, sun Sunday, October 7th, attend and participate in the teach-in at Portland Community College Cascade Campus located at North Albina and Killingsworth. The teach-in will run again from 12 noon until 5 p.m. The focus on all of this is end the wars and occupations, no nukes, no drones, money for jobs, education, health care, housing and the environment, not war, Main Street, not Wall Street, power to the people, and restore constitutional rights. So that, again, that's October 6th for the March and Rally uh, and the teaching on October 7th. Never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view our, all our shows and to subscribe. Mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or a Portland website at afd pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today for being here, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to you, our audience, for watching. We hope that you'll tune in again next week. Bye.